なんて神々しいのっていうかでかい。あ、ひなた、どんよファミリー、run a veterinary clinic? So, haven't you seen dogs that are like at least three quarters the size of Tia Tinu? I mean, I know she's a big poodle and everything, but really, that's the first impression you give of this all powerful big good of the season? Yeah, this is exactly why the writers left you underdeveloped. After a little recap of last week, we got right back into the action with the Neo King launching his next attack. Ha! Behold the depots of power! But yeah, he infected the entire town, appropriately starting with the symbol of all hope, the Lavendarma. On a side note, I generally want to know how many of those things did they sell? But yeah, it engulfed everyone and everything, which of course set off Latte's usual sneezing fit. Um, yeah, that kind of goes without saying. But hey, at least it wasn't a toll loss. At least they got that pointless paparazzi kid. Seriously, this little stalker pretty much contributed nothing to this show. But anyway, as it turned out, the king had been planning this attack for a while and even set up small infections that would go off as soon as he gained enough power. To make matters worse, it wasn't staying in just their little town. I'm. Eh, it's February 2021, and I think we're kind of over those jokes already. The Precure, of course, tried to take on the final boss, but without any final episode power ups, they stood no chance as he completely stonewalled them before just flicking them away. This took out everyone except for the sickly Latte, whom Shindoinen tried to deal with, but. Yeah, I think that was the censor saying this season has already had more than enough animal cruelty. No, of course, it was Tia Tinu who thankfully lived up to her word from last week. So, yeah, at least she's in the competent mentor tier, which I'll accept even if it is the 11th hour of the show. She managed to kind of deflect the king's attacks, at least I think that's what's happening here. Can't really help it when this episode clearly doesn't have the budget for it. However, while she did have the power of Sakuga by her side, she did have her loyal subjects. Okay, credit where it's due, I'm liking this remake of 101 Dalmatians more than what we got back in 96. Together, they managed to put up a barrier that froze the Neo King in place, giving the Precure time to regroup and plan their next attack. With that, Asumi teleported them away before Shindoinen could get to them, but she still pursued them because, of course, she was ordered to by her king. Away from any immediate danger, Asumi shared a theory she had come up with about the Byogans. It seemed pretty clear that they had the ability to absorb one another like an actual bacteria. <laughs> okay, Hinata, I'll take back what I say in the intro. That got a genuine laugh out of me. Thus, perhaps by using a power of a similar nature, they could bypass the Neo King's defenses. So, yeah, essentially, they want to create a vaccine to combat this anthropomorphic virus. Of course, they could have done that with Darizen, but obviously that's completely off the table. But Asumi's inhuman anatomy might actually produce a better counteragent. In keeping with her character of not wanting to see others suffer, Nodoka tried to talk her out of it in a nice scene. However, in an equally if not better bit, Asumi expressed her resolve and really wanted to do it both as a protector of the Earth and her friends, even reflecting all of the lessons she had learned during her little intro arc. Man boy, do I wish we could have gotten more scenes like this with our little six ranger, but unfortunately, we're in the end game of this series. And fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, Shindoinen found them. Initially, they just wanted to take a mega part from her to produce the vaccine, but of course, she wasn't just going to relinquish it, and in fact, used it on herself, giving her <laughs> a nice Dragon Quest armor there, lady. To be fair, at least you match up with Gwaiwaru's getup. But yeah, as I hinted at earlier, the animation in this episode was just not good. 
In all truth, the structure and layout of this fight wasn't bad, and there were even some fairly impressive bits here and there, but yeah, it was also clear that this was severely lacking in actual speed and impact, especially here, which in Doi Nen pushing down Nodoka, and yet it looks like they're falling slower than a couple of leaves in the wind. Still, to her credit, Shindoine was living up to her position as the pent ultimate final boss of the show, so how would our heroines deal with her? <laughs> so, let me get this straight. One of the final bosses of this season is being taken out with a tactic that would only otherwise work on Biff Tannen. Whoa, whoa, Biff. What's that? <laughs> But yeah, not only did our protagonist deliver a cheap shot on her, but after the arrows failed to fully purify her like they did with Darizen, they just double tapped her with the healing oasis while she was still down. Yeah, again, I must emphasize, these are in fact our protagonists. Credit where it's due though, Latte literally trying and succeeding in barking out orders to her team was both cute and a nice moment since those were her first actual words. With that, Asumi put Shindoinen inside of her. Hey, phrasing! And yeah, now I kind of wanted Asumi slash Shindoinen book, but that would have to wait as the episode ended with the Precure getting ready for their final battle with the king. Oh boy, this was a messy one. And I'm not just talking about the stiff animation, but man, did Shindoinen get a really disappointing send off. I mean, last week had some good, unexpected twists that left me really happy and satisfied. But this? It just makes me want to raise up my hands in confusion and just leave them up until next week. I probably shouldn't, I'll just cause nerve damage. Now to be fair, I do think a lot of my problems here might be due to some last minute changes. I joked, but it really does feel like they're trying to turn the Byogans into a representation of COVID so that our heroines could absolutely dominate them. This was even evidenced by the fact that the next episode preview featured almost no actual previews of next week other than these couple of shots. That and the fact that we'd even get titles for these last two episodes until very recently. Still, while I do understand the stress they were under to make it all work and could even kind of feel it in this rough animation, I still have to judge what we were given and yeah, it wasn't great. Shindoinen, for as much as she has been utilized for comedy relief, still came off as a fairly competent member of the Byokens to the point you could understand why the Neo King wanted to keep her around. So to see her get taken out with such a cheap trick felt really underwhelming and rushed to say the least. And yeah, it then brings up the little issue of how we still ended up with a cure that has a Byogen inside of her after they spent a whole episode trying to prevent that. Well, that was pointless. Granted, it was at least Asmi's choice, and her physical makeup seems to prevent as many ill effects as, say, Nodoka. Moreover, I did enjoy the scene right before with Asmi establishing her resolve and even calling back to previous events. And if anything, I am interested in seeing what having Shindoinen in her will do to her. So, while this was unquestionably a messy episode, both visually and storytelling wise, I do kind of want to see if they have any more insane twists that'll make my head spin. This has been one heck of a roller coaster, so let's see what they have for us in the end. Also, after the credits, we got one more preview for Tropical Rouge. It was mostly stuff we had already covered last week, with just a few new cuts, most notably Manatsu using the same luggage packing methods I use, and a few more interactions with Mr. Blue Crabs and Laura. But you know, I did include an evil grin of Laura in the thumbnail for a reason. A friend of mine showed me a few pages of the Kamikita Futago's manga adaptation of this series, and in this particular panel, our supporting protagonist outright said she was planning on using the Precure as stepping stones for her journey towards becoming the next Mermaid Queen. <laughs> Uh, yeah, what did I predict she might sound like in one of my previous videos? Thus, I would think a less toxic version of Pralati or Keisha. Yeah, never mind that noise, because assuming the Kamikita's version of this character is close to the anime version, which it usually is, especially in these initial chapters, I think we're gonna get an actual toxic mermaid here, folks. Oh boy, this season is gonna be fun. I actually managed to make two new things this week. 
First, a little reaction and analysis of the latest trailer for the upcoming spring movie, The City of Dreams. I was actually planning on doing it for this video originally, but as I got down all of my ideas, I quickly realized I wanted to dedicate a whole video for it, so I did. Hope you can enjoy some of my crazy theorizing about the concepts of dreams and reality that might relate to that movie. And in place of my usual Dremi review, I did something different that went over better than I ever expected, with a little introduction to another series I'm going to review on a bi-weekly basis, Powerpuff Girls Z. It was fascinating to learn more about this very different yet far superior spin-off to a certain Cartoon Network classic. To say the least, I think they went in with just the right mindset for the show we ended up with. Look forward to a review of episode 1 on Wednesday. And until then though, fair for now my friends, and uh... Oh uh, hi Mr. YouTube, um... I guess you're not all that happy with some of my recent view counts, are you? Well, you know, there's a perfectly good explanation for that, but before anything else, WHAT THE HELL IS THAT?!